Okay, welcome back. Um, today we will conclude our discussion on thermal solutions, thermal management and cooling solutions. Okay. So, if you recall in the last class, uh, we talked about some of these regular or more uh, commonly used cooling technologies starting right from heat sinks, then we looked at cold plates, we looked at thermoelectrics, we looked at heat pipes. So, these are uh, you know solutions maybe with the exception of thermoelectric uh, Peltier coolers, uh, but the others are pretty widely used. Uh, even thermoelectric coolers are used uh, though not uh, though not as common as the others. Okay. Now, but today what we will do is we will do two things. One is we will look into the aspect of what is called system level cooling. See so far we were only talking about I need to cool a CPU or I need to cool a graphics chip. So, these were all certain component level cooling solutions. Okay. So, today we will see that what about system level okay. because there are multiple components to be cooled. So, what are the different uh, constraints, what are the different limits that we need to conform to or that we need to comply with as a thermal designer. Okay. So, we will take the example of a laptop computer, it is a generic case, but even though the example is that of a laptop, um, many of the constraints that we are going to talk about are applicable to other computing platforms as well or for that matter any other electronic platforms. Okay. Many, and we are also going to talk about a few examples of novel thermal technologies. Okay. All right. So, with that first we will move on to as we said system level cooling. If you look at a laptop thermal design, what all do we have? Okay. So, you see a bunch of stuff written here. So, if you look at this figure, what we see is over here we see a heat pipe which is attached to the CPU. There is another second heat pipe that is attached to another heat generating device or component and then they are going to a fan right here is the fan and then you have these finned heat exchangers or heat sinks uh, over here. Okay. So, how is this cooled? Now, laptop, um, laptop computer works on what we call the evacuative mode in the sense that it sucks air inside through the various vents and holes that we see in our laptops. If you look, if you turn your laptop upside down and look at the bottom chassis, you will be able to see this strategically placed vents. Okay. So, as this fan runs, as it is powered on and, and it runs, it actually sucks in ambient air. Okay. That ambient air coming through the different you know openings and vents actually flows over the different heat generating components. Okay. It can be memory, it can be you know some of the lesser power dissipating components, it can be the voltage regulators and as it flows over it picks up heat okay. and then finally it reaches this location of the fan where it is pressurized. So, the pressure goes up recall the fan PQ curve. So, fans job is to pressurize the air and then it is thrown out through this heat exchanger and as it goes through the heat exchanger it also picks up the heat that is transported by the heat pipes from these uh, from these components. Okay. So, again for certain high heat dissipating components such as CPU such as graphics we have what we call a dedicated cooling solution in this case a heat pipe connected to a fan heat fan heat sink arrangement. But many of the others for example, this memory, this platform controller hub, the wireless LAN. So, these depend on the on the air movement as the air gets into the inside this uh, system and flows over that air is you know uh, absorbing the heat and then bringing it to this location and then dissipating it and throwing. So, what comes out therefore, is hot air because the air that entered is ambient air, but it has picked up heat from all these components as well as from the CPU which was conducted to the heat sink or heat exchanger by the by the heat pipe and then it is thrown out. All right. Now, what are the limits that we need to conform to? So, one is T j recall the, the junction temperatures every component will have its own junction temperature that needs to be conformed to. 
some of the components which are plastic molded or which has a ceramic lid you don't really find a lot of ceramic packages uh, in your in your very uh, in your laptops for example but uh, here the limit is on the case remember the case tc that case temperature is on the lid or the heat spreader okay so these have their own limits for example tj can be 100 degrees or 105 degrees t case for a memory which is a plastic encapsulated uh, device uh, or component is going to be let's say 85 degrees centigrade okay and these have to be conformed to what else and now this is where the constraints of having a portable device like a laptop comes in okay see the hot air that comes out should not be so hot that it burns your skin okay so there is therefore an exhaust temperature limit which is also known as the thermodynamic limit or thermal limit okay why is it called thermodynamic limit we'll come to that okay or we can say it right now actually so remember if you have remember the fan and system impedance curve and the and the operating point is the point of intersection so what is the system impedance what is the system here whose impedance curve we need to consider that is flow through this entire laptop okay the bottom the bottom unit of the laptop computer and the fan curve of course is what what is what comes with this blower fan okay so now the total amount of mass flow rate or volume flow rate of air and therefore mass flow rate of air which is density times volume flow rate for a given volume flow rate what is the total amount of heat that i can dissipate it is q equals to m dot cp which is the specific heat times the exhaust temperature of the air minus inlet temperature which is ambient okay exhaust so therefore if i put an exhaust limit let us say 75 degrees in a 30 degrees ambient okay so 75 minus 30 is 45 times the mass flow rate times the specific heat of air that gives me the total amount of heat that i can pack inside this this box this laptop the sum total of the power dissipated by all components cannot exceed this thermodynamic limit that is set because of this exhaust temperature limit for a given mass flow rate so therefore now your next question is okay fine but that's for a given mass flow rate so i can always run the fan at a higher rpm supply more voltage run it at a higher rpm and have ma more mass flow rate fair enough but then what prevents you from doing that is acoustic noise because higher the rpm higher is going to be the acoustic noise and nobody wants to work close to a very noisy laptop right so therefore the maximum rpm of the fan and therefore the maximum flow rate that i can get is limited by the acoustic noise okay if that was not all there's a final temperature limit which is known as the chassis temperature i should be able to put the laptop on my thigh i mean on my lap without burning it without the without the danger of burning my skin just like the exhaust temperature limit okay so there's there are multiple challenges at both the chip and the system levels okay and that is where we need to play a balancing game i can have a very good cooling solution for for the for the cpu and 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 put in a lot of power in the cpu but then my thermodynamic limit will become or will pose a constraint to the power that i can have on the other components okay so i'll have a very powerful cpu but accompanied by a very low memory a very weak wireless lan uh uh not so good graphics and so on okay so this is the balancing level this balancing game that we need to keep in mind okay so let's look at platform power limitations what are platform power limitations okay so what is the maximum total power that i can dissipate from this system okay so the platform power is going to be the mass flow rate times specific heat times the exhaust minus ambient plus a little bit of natural convection from the hot surfaces whether it's a screen 
whether it is the keyboard. Okay. Now, what is this fan flow rate going to be? That is going to be this intersection point of the fan and the system impedance curve. Okay. So, now if that is constrained, how can I increase this platform power? I can either move more air and how can I do that? If I want to move more air, I have to either increase the fan performance that is go from fan 1 to fan 2 or I have to lower the system impedance that is go from this system in this green system impedance curve to this orange system into impedance curve or, or do both. right? So, if I change the fan I go from point 1 to point 2 which has corresponds to a higher volumetric flow rate or if I change the system impedance curve I go from 1 to 3 or if I do both I go from 1 to 4. But if you think of it practically going from fan 1 to fan 2 is challenging if acoustics are concerned. Okay. If acoustics are considered then probably I cannot go to fan 2 or, or basically op, or shift the fan curve from 1 to 2. On the other hand if I want to lower the system resistance curve what do I have to do? I, I have to reduce the flow resistance through my laptop. But if you look at the trend where we want to go for thinner laptops actually the trend is the opposite. The thinner you go and the lesser internal clearance we have higher will be my system resistance for flow. So, the system impedance curve actually is shifting to the left not to the right. So, therefore, moving from either fan 1 to fan 2 or system resistance curve green to orange is challenging if acoustics and form factor are considered. So, what is my other option? The other option is to increase my passive dissipation. Okay. So, uh, okay, let us let us complete that if you want to do passive dissipation then you have to think of some other ways how can I increase the passive dissipation from the keyboard from the from the screen, but there also you have limits because if the keyboard is very hot the palm rest where you put your rest to your palm when you are working on the laptop and you cannot even operate on the keyboard then that does not help or the, if the screen becomes too hot let us say I am able to get some of the power back on the back side of the screen and dissipate it. But if that gets too hot then your you know the visual effect the screen display beyond a certain temperature is going to be going to get affected. Okay. But this, this is what I am trying to say what are the, what are the mean ways I can increase or I can have a more powerful system these are the ways how you are going to do that yeah that is the challenge. Okay. Now, what we will do is we will shift gear. So, that was just to give you an overview of uh, what is a system level thermal design what it involves. Okay. Now, let us look at some of the shift gears and look at some novel cooling solutions. Refrigeration we talked about that, but this one is actually a pretty unique refrigeration system you want to put it inside a laptop okay. and this was done at Intel. Uh, if you want to do this then think about it if you think of a refrigerator household refrigerator the prime component in the refrigeration cycle is the compressor. Okay. Now, the compressor if you look at it it is probably you know this big about a foot in height about 8 inches in diameter extremely heavy. Okay. How do you put that inside a laptop? So, that was a challenge and uh, here this was again a collaborative work. Intel worked with a manufacturer called Embraco who designed a miniature compressor. So, it was co-designed by Intel and Embraco. It, it is probably the size of a you know double A cell battery cell that we use in torches. Okay. And what they did was they put it inside the uh, there were two options one is to put it inside the laptop okay. that was possible. Uh, and that was also demonstrated by Intel, but the problem is that there were some reservations about you know having a refrigerant inside this portable computer, what if it leaks, what if what if it is not fully sealed, so on and so forth. Okay. And what about vibrations because you have a reciprocating compressor inside. So, then what they said was you know the other option was to put it in the docking station. You have a docking station where I mean especially uh, people who work in the corporate world 
we use docking stations pretty often right and uh, where the computer docking station is a port replicator you go and put your laptop there and then to the docking station you can attach a keyboard a wireless a display in a, in a bigger screen and uh, it's just a port replicator and you also have a feature of keying in or the locking the computer and take the key away so that it is also secured okay uh, then what what was thought of is okay you know many a times when we run these high end gaming or high end computations we are mostly at our desk and where the laptop can be in the docked mode can be on the docking station i am not really mobile at that point you know i don't do a high level computation sitting in a cafeteria there i primarily do some web surfing check my emails maybe do a press powerpoint presentation okay so any high level workload is typically done when there is a high probability that you will be in a docked condition. So, therefore, the idea was move this refrigeration based cooling solution to the docking station. Okay. So, what happens? So, that is what you see this is the docking station on the right hand side, this is the docking station and you have a miniature compressor inside and you also have the refrigeration loop, the evaporator and condenser okay, inside the refrigerator, inside this docking station sorry. The entire refrigeration system is inside the docking station and what it does is it acts as an air conditioner. So, the air which was coming inside the laptop which was which is otherwise at ambient temperature is now pre chilled. So, therefore, instead of coming in at 25 degrees it can be chilled to let us say 5 degrees or 10 degrees okay? and so it is already chilled. So, think about it platform power m dot c p T exhaust minus T ambient is what we wrote. Now, it is with T exhaust minus T inlet which is 15 degrees less than ambient. Okay. So, if the exhaust temperature was 75 degrees in a 30 degree ambient, you had a delta T of 45 degrees to play with. So, that times the mass flow rate times the specific heat was your platform power limitation and plus a little bit of passive dissipation. Now, if I am able to pre chill the air down to 10 degrees. So, I get additional to the, so now the limit is 75 minus 10 instead of 75 minus 30. So, instead of 45 I was 65 degrees delta T to play with 65 degrees temperature gradient to play with from 45. So, do the math you see it is almost a 40, 45 percent increase in the platform power right. So, that is what is possible. So, refrigerated docking station design all right very very not just the, of course, our technology challenge of having a refrigeration loop of this size and now even a larger one uh, and even now a very clever or innovative one where they move this refrigeration based cooling into the docking station. Okay. So, for large gaming systems etcetera this is a perfect solution. This is another one the previous one was you know a battery shaped con compressor. This is a regular compressor except that it is so mini it is so miniaturized. So, this Aspen compressors make these and uh, you can see you can you can use, use this in a variety of uh, applications okay. in tele, large telecom installations refrigeration based designs okay. in, in various electrical appliances in short in maybe in small refrigerators in, in medicine cabinets so on and so forth. So, lots of lots of such applications possible okay. maybe even battery pack for, for stationary ones not uh, for hybrid electric vehicles probably I do not know uh, because this compressor will not hybrid electric is still okay. electric vehicles this compressor is going to consume power which is going to come from the battery. So, you are trying to cool down the battery to increase its efficiency, but in the process you are also using the energy from the battery to run this processor. So, I do not know uh, we have to do some trade off, but uh, for static uh, installations where batteries are required this is possible. Okay. All right. Micro pin fin cold plates. We talked about cold plate, and now you see this cold plate is directly in the form of micro pillars etched on the back side of the silicon. So, instead of a cold plate sitting on, you can have this right away on the silicon. Now, just put a lid and have this water flow through these, you know, this micro, micro pins as, as in the directions shown here. Okay. So, that is possible. It is also possible as I said that in the previous one that 
It is also possible that as the water or whatever the, the cooling liquid flows through this micro pin heat sink, it may start to boil if the heat flux is high enough. Okay? And boiling heat transfer, the heat transfer coefficient is very, very high. So, it can be single phase, it can be two phase. So, the one that was um, that I am taking this figure from Ravi Prasher uh, right now in Lawrence Berkeley lab in, in USA. Uh, we used to work together, in fact, he was my technical mentor when I first joined Intel in USA right after my PhD. So, Ravi was, Ravi has been a, um, you know, he's one of me, one of my great mentors in my career so far. So, this is one paper that was, he, where he was a lead author on micro pin heat sinks um, for, for cooling of microprocessors. Okay. Electro wetting on dielectric, very interesting. This is where we are trying to make a water droplet move. Okay. So, the basic principle of electro wetting is, see when you put a water droplet on a surface and if it is hydrophobic, then the droplet is going to stand and there is something called a wetting angle. Okay. This angle is the wetting angle. All right. And if the wetting angle is high, then it is called hydrophobic. And if the wetting is better, the angle is low, like an acute angle here, then and, and you see here, then it is hydrophilic, it is a wetting surface. Now, what is shown is on the same surface, if we are able to create a potential difference, okay, just in this manner, then it is possible that under the influence of this externally applied potential or voltage, the droplet, the contact angle or the wetting angle can change and therefore, a hydrophobic surface can be converted to a hydrophilic surface. Okay. It is governed by this equation as is shown here. Okay. The original wetting angle theta y and the modified wetting angle theta as you can see cos theta is greater than cos theta y which means theta is less than cos is theta y sorry theta is less than theta y. So, the wetting angle has reduced. Okay. So, now the question is that if you have two such electrodes next to each other and I power up one of them by applying a voltage and the other one is not, it is at ground, then on one side there will be an imbalance that the contact angle theta 1 and the contact angle theta 2 are not going to be equal, it is not going to be a symmetric droplet anymore because one end is resting on a powered electrode, the other end is restricted on a grounded electrode, is, is resting on a grounded electrode. So, therefore, as a result it can be shown by force balance that this creates a propelling force in the forward direction as shown here. Okay. So, as a result what happens is there is a movement of this droplet. If you now think of an array of electrodes and you switch them sequentially one after the other, the droplet is going to move from one to the next, 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 next and so on. Okay. So, there is a this, this crawling movement of the droplet, which is possible as is shown here. This is on the right hand side, Cheng and Chen. You see a droplet which is move, which is being driven towards a hot spot through this strategic patterning of electrodes. Okay. And this one is a video from the microfluidics lab. Let me see if I can play it. So, you have a series of electrodes as you can see one after the other and a droplet is sitting on the first electrode and what we will see is it is going to move, you saw that right, it moved from one electrode to the other and it is moving continuously. As the electrodes are sequentially turned on one after the other, so now the camera is now again repositioned and you see how the droplet is, is moved. So, think about it, if I have a hot spot as is shown here and I move this droplet on top, so as the droplet moves over it will absorb the heat and then I take it somewhere else where it rejects it and again comes back. So, in a closed loop I can move these droplets. Okay? There are also ways to generate droplets, break droplets into smaller drops, etcetera, etcetera. Okay? All right. Next one, synthetic jets. So, synthetic jets you can think of it as a diaphragm 
and if you the diaphragm can be made to move up and down okay and typically the way one of the ways we do that is by attaching a piezo crystal on the diaphragm and then you know putting an ac voltage across it so as a result what happens is during one one uh, half of the ac cycle when the piezo crystal contracts or ex and, and the other half when it expands it basically uh, moves the diaphragm either downwards or upwards as it moves downwards it entrains air from the surroundings through this aperture and as it moves upwards it throws it out in the form of a jet so think about it this happening repeatedly so you get this puffs of air coming out and if you can now direct it at the place where you want to cool then you get enhanced cooling at that spot okay so this is the principle of synthetic jets so here you see this is there i was showing a diaphragm with a with a hole or opening here you see a planar synthetic jet it's a slit and you have diaphragms on both sides you see this piezo crystal on top this is actually a concept from ge ge global research dcj they call it dual cooling jets because you have two diaphragms one at the top one at the bottom and the cavity is inside so on one half it kind of the diaphragm caves in oh sorry diaphragm bulges out and it entrains here and then when it caves in it uh, it gives it out in the form of a jet and if you direct the jet on a on an electronic board then you will have cooling right so here you see they try to replace the fan inside a laptop you see that you see this uh, heat pipe over here and the fan is replaced by a dc dual cooling jet okay so i'll show you a video uh, over here from from ge what is exciting is that we have developed a new kind of method to move air it's called the dual piezo cooling jet it's an air mover that doesn't require bearings or doesn't require a dc motor so we are enabling the next generation of tin products with this new technology that comes out of our labs we basically copied nature dual cool jets are really based on the idea of your lungs they basically contract and expand as that happens the air is sucked in through your nose and out or through your mouth so we copied that to create a synthetic jet we thought about is there any way that we can actually create these jets in situ wherever we want to do that mainly it was active flow control for aerofiles or for different parts of the aircraft and engine a dual piezo cooling jet is two metal discs with piezo elements on either side of it by activating the piezo with an ac signal the device can actually pump like a bellows pump when you do that at a very high rate say a couple hundred hertz you get a very nice net airflow produced by this device by pulling in the air from the surroundings expelling it at high velocity through the center and there are different tricks you can do to make it smaller larger but the particular concept can be scaled or modified to whatever your application needs are here we have an aviation chassis with six dual cooled jets mounted to the frame we have now switched to a thermal infrared image. We're heating the chassis to 80 C and we're going to drop that temperature down to uh, around 40 C. When each dual cool jet is turned on, air flows from the orifice and will blow up through the fins to the surrounding air, thus cooling the internal electronics of the chassis. As engineers, we like to try new things. So we actually bought a state-of-the-art Ultrabook laptop, opened it up, and replace the fan inside this device with the dual piezo cooling jet. Actually, it was a perfect fit. There was, in the X, Y dimension, a lot of space available to put the jet in. In the Z dimension, we actually had a lot of space left over. Because the dual cool jet is such a thin solution, there's a lot of space left over that allows this laptop to become thinner if necessary, or that space could be taken up with other electronics. This is the first laptop in the world that's cooled by a dual piezo cooling jet. Fin is the new fast. Increasingly today, manufacturers are looking to differentiate their products based on the form factor and how their customers are using the computing versus how much computing power is built into the product. It's a theme towards more power in smaller spaces. We can put these dual piezo cooling jets into a lot of very hard to reach places. So it's a very localized and very efficient way to cool 
electronics at the source of the heat generation for people who have a, a laptop computer in their hands or on their lap. They don't want to deal with annoying noises or buzzing. So the acoustic profile of this technology, it's something that we can tune based on the, the cooling that's required. That's one of the roles that we play in GE licensing is finding synergies between these technologies that initially are developed or invented to satisfy some GE business need, but we can translate those to similar demands in other markets outside of GE. That's where GE licensing steps in to make those connections. Okay, so I think that was a pretty nice and illustrative video. And uh, I also saw some of my ex-colleagues, Peter. Peter was did a lot of work on this dual cooling jets. Um, Brian helped him ably. And we also saw Syed. Syed was looking more from the aviation and flow control point of view, not so much from thermal cooling. Uh, all of them very brilliant engineers. Okay. All right, uh, we will end with the last technology which is called very similar to synthetic jets is called piezoelectric flappers. So think about it, it is a metal or plastic blade with a piezo crystal attached at one end and you put an AC signal. So what happens? Just like a bimetallic strip, but however what happens is during one half when the piezo contracts it pushes the, it pulls it upwards, pulls the blade upwards, in the second one it pulls it downwards. So think about it, when we feel hot what do we do? We take a piece of maybe, you know, this Japanese fans definitely one, if otherwise, if that is not possible, we take a newspaper or, or an exercise book and start doing this, right? So it's exactly the same thing. Can I take a piezo flapper, take it next to a hot component and blow air? And if I do that, then I'll get localized cooling, okay? The resultant pulsating flow will enhance heat transfer locally. And that is exactly what we see. This is a high speed image. Of, of one of the piezo fans and uh, this is a CFD simulation of the same, okay. So thank you very much, I think that uh, just wanted to give you a flavor of really what the GE tagline imagination at work, okay. Uh, you can really see cooling, that, that problem has existed since, since mankind <laughs> existed, but uh, since the advent of mankind, but then there are always so much of scope of innovations and many a times the constraints that we work in, the environment, the, the constraints of the application forces us to come up with these new solutions and some of the examples is what we show. There are lots more, uh, maybe later if I ever take a course just on thermal design, I will be able to show many more of these examples. But this was just to give you a flavor and, and tickle your brains and, and make you think there is so much of scope for innovation. All right, so thank you very much. With that, we come to the end of thermal management and cooling solutions. And from the next lecture, we will go on to a different topic. Okay, thank you very much.